Back in 2019, on a cool spring day in Hamburg, a 25-year-old woman took the stage at one of the largest digital marketing conventions in the world. And she'd say something that would make a lot of people angry. My name is Verena. I'm the fourth generation of Balsen. We um, bake for 130 years cakes. I would like to try an experiment with you and we'll see what happens. I would like to try not to say something vermeintlich schlaues to say. Balsen is a baked goods company, most known for the Leibniz butter biscuit, the Choco Leibniz milk chocolate biscuit, as well as animal crackers. They're a German family-run cookie-cutter company with pastries that are profitable producing hundreds of millions in yearly revenue. And that revenue is something that Verena made the mistake of appreciating a bit too publicly. Mir gehört ein Viertel von Basen, da freue ich mich auch drüber. Das soll mir auch weiterhin gehören. Ich will Geld verdienen und mir Segeljachten kaufen von meiner Dividende und sowas. This was cringe. Not only because she was a 25-year-old family-made millionaire who wanted a yacht, but also because her wealth came from a company that had used forced labor during World War II. From around 1940 to the end of the Second World War, the Balsen Company obtained hundreds of forced laborers to be used at their factory in Hanover. What made things worse for Verena, though, is that she did not take kindly to the criticism of her speech. Later, she told the German tabloid that the forced laborers were before her time, that they were paid exactly as much as German workers, and that the company treated them well. Surprisingly, people didn't think it was a particularly clever clapback. And days later, Verena was taken out of the spotlight and issued a public apology. But it was too late. Balsen stirred the pot, so investigative reporters decided to add some more ingredients. They discovered that the owners of the Balsen Biscuit Empire had been members of the Nazi party and donated to the SS. Many of the involuntary laborers used in Hanover came from a factory in Kiev, a factory that the Balsen family had taken over after Nazi occupation. So the Balsens hired a German historian, Manfred Krieger, to investigate them, only after it was convenient for them to do so. Now, whether the Balsens are a family to be upset about, we don't know. Farina Balsen is no Nazi, but we can tell you whether the Balsen family history and how they handled it is truly unique. It's not. The Balsens aren't alone, and they're so, so far from the worst. Germany is the economic powerhouse of the European Union, a country with an iron grip of the global manufacturing industry and a specialized powerful Mittelstand. But the strong German economy is built on top of a business tradition that's quite different from other Western countries. Some of its largest and most important enterprises are largely or fully controlled by families. And families have histories. My name is David de Jong, a Middle East correspondent for the Dutch Financial Daily, and I wrote Nazi Billionaires. Nazi Billionaires is the story of five of Germany's wealthiest business dynasties, the way they profiteered from the Third Reich, the way they got involved with Hitler's regime, the way they got away with the crimes, and the way the heirs are dealing with these crimes today. This is a video about three of these families. Families that share a difficult Nazi past, but also produce products that you likely know and can consume today and three families who, instead of fully acknowledging that past, have twisted and turned and fought trying to hide it until, of course, it was convenient not to. Families that have accrued so much wealth and top financial leaderboards, but with names and faces you don't know. So this story starts with a face you probably do. Heinrich Himmler was one of the leading figures of the Nazi party, and one of the main architects of the Holocaust. He was appointed by Hitler to the Reichsführer of the Schutzstaffel, which eventually led him to the position of Reichskommissar for the strengthening of the German ethnic stock. Himmler could decide who was German in occupied areas and how to efficiently handle those who were not. He established the first concentration camp, which impressed Hitler so much that Himmler was tasked with establishing the entire system. He was entrusted with implementing the final solution of the Jewish question, and his Einsatzgruppen alone killed nearly two million people. 
But we're not here to talk about the atrocities of Himmler. We're here to talk about his friends. The Freundeskreis der Wirtschaft was a group of German industrialists that served as a middle ground between Nazi party and industry. The group coordinated around 1 million German marks to be used by Himmler outside of budget, which included the Aryan eugenics research. One of the especially passionate Nazis in that group was the CEO of a company most know a bit too well. Richard Kosolowski. He was a Nazi ideologue. He had a portrait of, uh, of Hitler in his office. He handed out signed copies of Mein Kampf to new employees, and in Himmler's inner circle, he attended practically every meeting at the Aero Club in Berlin. Kosolowski funded Himmler's Lebensborn, the plan to support Aryanization by seizing children from parents, categorizing them, and reassigning them to different ones, with the unwanted ones being murdered in concentration camps. Luckily for Kosolowski, he was the stepfather of a child who would never have to be reassigned. Rudolf August Utker. This is a big American's pizza. Lay it la familia way. Dürerische Pizza Restaurante. Dr. Utker then. Go to a frozen food section of your local supermarket or look for baking supplies, and you'll be sure to encounter that same name. Dr. Utger is one of the largest family-run German multinationals on the planet, with yearly sales revenue in the multi-billions. Rudolf August considered his stepfather Richard Kosolowski, the CEO of Utger, his real father. I couldn't imagine a better father than Richard Kosolowski, Rudolf August said in an interview of a German newspaper more than a half a century later, nor a better teacher for me. Unlike his real father, Rudolf August was a real Nazi. Rudolf August was not drafted, but volunteered to join the Waffen-SS. It was only for the most uh, fervently ideological Nazis who would join the Waffen-SS. It was a very stringent uh, training and a very stringent selection process, so it was abnormal in that sense. Rudolf August later claimed that he didn't know the extent of the concentration camps, which was weird because he trained in one. So part of Rudolf August Utker's training took place at Dachau concentration camp, and he would later claim that the barracks were separate from the concentration camp, but in fact it was part of the same complex, and concentration camp prisoners would clean the barracks of the you know, aspiring SS officers that were trained there. Yet, Rudolf's Nazi past never really mattered after the war ended. Although his family benefited from Aryanizations, the use of forced and slave labor, Rudolf August was detained only for his role in the Waffen-SS. The denazification of Rudolf August Utker never even went to trial. Instead, he was exonerated by an internal subcommittee made up entirely of his company's own employees. A few months later, British officials confirmed his exoneration. He lied that he was forcibly moved to the Waffen-SS, even though he volunteered, and also had a knack for Aryanizing property, so instead, Rudolf August was made CEO. And over the next few decades, he turned Dr. Utker into a multi-billion euro empire. When he died in 2007, the company was distributed among his eight children, making each of them individual billionaires. And they each inherited a similar stake in the Dr. Utker conglomerate, which at this point was you know, one of the largest privately owned companies in, in Germany. But Rudolf was a quiet man, so he was able to hide his past quite well. In a press statement to us, the Utker group clarified that he in fact vetoed any investigation into the Nazi history of the company until after his death. It wasn't until 2008, a year after his death, that Rudolf's children commissioned historians to truly understand their company's history, and an uncomfortable history they found. In 2013, August Utker, his eldest son, acknowledged that his father was a Nazi. But this announcement does not mean that the family was suddenly okay with being fully transparent about their past. Rudolf August married multiple times. Although the older Utker children were open to commissioning the study, the three younger children were less receptive. The mother of the three youngest, Maya, rejected the investigation's claim that her late husband was a committed Nazi. But Rudolf was, of course, a quiet man. In order to maintain harmony and unity within his family, Rudolf August had hoped that his eldest son, August, would train Alfred to take over the position of CEO, a forced power split between oldest and youngest. But when August gave up operational management, he'd promote his younger brother, Richard, instead. This was enough to split Dr. Utker into two, and today they still remain ideologically divided. There were two foundations under Dr. Utker. 
But where the eldest siblings decided to change the foundation named after their Nazi grandparents, the youngest siblings decided to keep their Rudolf August foundation. As it is, without any kind of cognizance of his history as an Waffen SS officer. In a statement to us, the younger siblings' communications team argues that the name of their foundation is kept because the family has already transparently dealt with their past through the commissioned historical study and provenance research into the Utker art collection. A majority of Utker sales are generated outside of Germany, but go to their English site and you'll have a hard time figuring out who Rudolf Otkus Utker or his stepfather really were. You can find the link to the study they commissioned, but you can only buy that book in German. In English, you can learn that Rudolf August rebuilt and helped diversify Dr. Utker on the company website, but you'll see no mention of him voluntarily signing up to join the Waffen SS. Today, his children are some of the wealthiest people on the planet, and although the Utker children have put some questionable effort into bringing attention to their family's Nazi past, there are some families who have put in no effort at all. In this video, we are discussing dark family secrets, which should be revealed and openly discussed. But there are certain types of information that should stay private. Information such as your personal data. Online data breaches are rising worldwide. The business of data brokers is booming. They sell aggregated profiles with security numbers, login credentials, addresses, and much more. If your mailbox is full of spam, or if you're receiving a robocall from time to time, it might be because you're on some of those lists. Incogni, the sponsor of today's video, reaches out to data brokers on your behalf requests your personal data removal, and deals with any objections from their side. Through the link in the description below, and with the code FERNTV, you can get an exclusive 60% discount on an annual Incogni plan. Our sponsors enable us to fund time and money consuming projects like this one, so feel free to check out Incogni. We think that data protection cannot be valued highly enough. In May of 2017, three people met at a restaurant outside of Munich. A publisher, a journalist from a Bavarian public state broadcaster, and a man named Ernst Knut Stahl. According to the publisher, under oath, Stahl had said, there's danger ahead. There's a street in New York with lots of investment bankers, lawyers, and so forth. Coincidentally, they are all Jews, but that's not relevant here. They want to push Germany into ruin. They control everything. The publisher also said that Stahl followed up by saying that there should be a newspaper, one that actually writes the truth, and that Peter Bartels, a former editor-in-chief of Bild, would help. Months later, a newspaper did show up with Bartels helping write it, a paper openly supportive of the AfD. The AfD was a relatively young political party in Germany at this point. Initially anti-Euro, it shifted course at the end of 2014, during the refugee crisis. Today, it is considered right-wing extremist and racist by the German Institute for Human Rights. Now, the question naturally arose, where did the newspaper's funding come from? See, Ernst Knut Stahl, the man who talked about Jews controlling everything, was not any man. He was the asset manager for one of the wealthiest German billionaires, August von Fink Jr. August Jr. was a private man, the eldest of the von Fink empire. He passed away in late November 2021 and left behind an investment in real estate empire where the real estate is set to encompass more than half of Munich city center and much of the land uh, surrounding Munich, which is some of the priciest land in the world. But when August von Fink Jr. was alive, you wouldn't find him living in Germany because he had moved to Switzerland for tax reasons. And it's that knack of evading any cost that he must have gotten from his father. Back in 1931, in Berlin's Hotel Kaiserhof, Hitler was meeting Germany's wealthiest to ask them to acquire weapons for the SA, the paramilitary wing of the Nazi party. The first man Hitler would speak to would be August von Fink Sr., the father of August von Fink Jr. The senior controlled Merrick Fink and held significant shares of Allianz and Munich RE because his father co-founded Munich RE and Allianz, two of the world's largest insurers and reinsurers today. Von Fink, known for being the stingiest man in Bavaria, had little issues with raising money for Nazis. August von Fink Sr. helped promise 5 million Reichsmarks via Allianz to arm the SA. And for his financial services, von Fink was rewarded with political advantages by being able to target his Jewish enemies. Once the persecution against Jews really ramped up in 1937-38, he wrote a letter saying that one of his main competitors, Martin Aufhauser, should be 
expropriated, basically, on the basis of um, the bank being in Jewish ownership. Fink wrote a letter to Munich's Chamber of Commerce that the German private banking sector is still largely made up of non-Aryan firms. The gradual cleansing of this trade, which is so strongly influenced by the Jewish element, must not be halted by the granting of applications for exemptions, but must be promoted by all means. Aufhauser's bank was seized during Kristallnacht, and von Fink got a taste for a forbidden fruit that he wouldn't stop chasing. J. Dreyfus was one of the largest German Jewish private banks, and Fink put the Jewish owner, Willy Dreyfus, under so much pressure that he ended up selling the bank far under the market value what the bank was worth. Fink also went ahead and did the same thing to the Rothschilds. Aris von Fink Sr. ended up buying uh, the Rothschild Bank for tens of millions under its market value, while its owner, its main owner, the Rothschild heir, uh, was held captive by the SS in a hotel in central Vienna. Now, von Fink was not merely a financial opportunist. He was also a real Nazi. Aris von Fink Sr. was very much a committed Nazi, even though he tried to hide it uh, as best he could after the end of the Second World War. Hans Schmidt Polix, an Allianz executive and friend of von Fink, stated after the war that von Fink believed that Hitler was sent by God to save the German people. Fink remained a convinced Nazi who would have died for his beliefs if necessary. But for his beliefs, he did not have to die. Fink didn't actually have to do much at all. So at August for Fink denazification trial, strange things started to happen. Evidence started to disappear from the case file. Witnesses who had incriminating evidence against von Fink suddenly didn't turn up. But most importantly, Julius Herf watered down the indictment against von Fink. Long after the trial ended, there was reporting that Herf had been blackmailed by von Fink's accomplices. Herf was homosexual. There were rumors of letters that he had sent to younger men that were used against him as part of the blackmail. And so von Fink escaped justice, although he did have to pay around 2,000 marks towards a general restitution fund, but he appealed it on the basis of a knee injury that he had sustained during World War I, which was actually granted. He never had any kind of criminal penalty uh, against him. He was, went off scot-free. By 1970, August von Fink Sr. became Germany's second richest man. After his death, his eldest son, August Jr., inherited his fortune, and the Jr. sold the Allianz and Merrick Fink shares to Barclays Bank. When August Jr. died in 2021, his wife and their children inherited a fortune estimated around 8 billion euros. However, attempt to find any acknowledgement by that family of their wealth's past, and it seems little can be found. There's no evidence that Argus von Fink Jr. or his children or his wife have any indication that they want to come clean with regards to the Nazi past of the von Fink dynasty. But the von Fink family may not even be the most wealthy, but silent of the Nazi billionaire dynasties. In September of 2015, the richest woman in Germany and one of the richest people in the entire world spoke at a press conference. Deutschland ist ein Gründerland. Was zur Gründerzeit Männer wie Karl von Linde oder Robert Bosch waren. Suzanne Clauden is one of the heirs of the most successful German business dynasties in history, BMW. But in a press conference where she references Germany's greatest founders, there's a reason that Clauden makes absolutely no reference to her innovative founder father or grandfather. On a February evening in 1933, a few billionaires met at the official residence of the Reichstag president Hermann Göring. Present were Baron August von Fink, Kurt Schmidt, a few chemical company executives, Gustav Krupp, Friedrich Flick, and a man named Gunter Quandt. Only a few weeks earlier, Adolf Hitler had seized power as chancellor, and he met the businessmen that February night personally to tell them the future of the nation. On March 5, 1933, the people of Germany would vote in Germany's last election. If Hitler were to be elected, the titans of German industry would get a stable business climate but only if he was elected. That night, the founder of BMW helped write off a check for thousands of Reichsmarks to a man who had just told him that his goal was the end of German democracy. Gunther was one of the largest private industry users of forced and slave labor in Nazi Germany. And Gunther is special, because unlike the other military industrialists, like Krupp and Flick, he was never held accountable for his crimes, and crimes he did commit. 
he became a leader of the armament economy, fueling the Third Reich with munition and batteries. Günter Quandt was a brazen opportunist who tried to expand his business empire in all ways possible, profiteering from the Third Reich through mass uh, weapons production, through the expropriation of Jewish-owned companies, expropriation of companies in German-occupied territories, as well as the mass exploitation of forced and slave laborers. At its Accumulatorenfabrik in Hanover, by 1943, forced labor made around half of the workforce. AFA, and is today known as Farta, which produces the batteries in your airports, had a massive new factory in Hanover, in the center of Germany. In collaboration with the SS, they built a sub-concentration camp on the factory complex. The concentration camp was set up with gallows and an execution area. Prisoners had accidents with boiling hot metal, and hands and arms would get stuck in Gunther's machinery, with flesh and bones being ripped off while fully conscious. Random beatings, uh, executions, no medical care. The company calculated that there would be a turnover rate of 80 people dying each month, with slaves lasting on average for six. Gunther Quandt ended up using about 60,000 forced and slave laborers across his battery and weapons companies. But the topic of forced and slave labor did not come up at all during his denazification trial. Neither did the many Aryanizations that he had done all across Europe and in Nazi Germany. Gunter Quandt, like von Fink, was deemed a fellow traveler who only had to pay a monetary fine. He got off scot-free and never received any kind of criminal punishment. But Gunter Quandt had a stronger link with Nazi Germany than the supply chain of thousands of slave laborers in exchange for ammunition and batteries. His second wife divorced him and instead married one of the chief architects of the Nazi regime. Goebbels was the chief propagandist and also doting stepfather of Gunter and Magda's son, Harold Kwan. Harold Kwan grew up in one of the most radical families in the Third Reich. And he ended up being the only one of Magda Goebbels' children who uh, survived the Second World War. Because Magda Goebbels ended up murdering her six children and then committing murder-suicide with her husband. After the war, he became one of the wealthiest men in West Germany, but he passed away in an airplane accident at the age of 45, leaving his descendants with hundreds of millions. Today, his daughters and Goebbels' step-grandchildren maintain a low profile, having their wealth managed through the Harold Quant family office, which reports to have three sole and one majority shareholding in several financial service companies with approximately $17 billion in assets. The inheritors of millions are now silent billionaires today. But as interesting as Harold Quant and his daughters are, it's Herbert Quant that deserves a bit more attention. Herbert Quant was the uh, eldest son of Günther Quant, and he later became known as the savior of BMW, because he saved BMW from bankruptcy in the 1960s. Today, you can still find a BMW foundation in Herbert Quant's name, which promotes responsible leadership. And Herbert Quant was quite the responsible leader. He was a Nazi criminal who built a concentration camp in uh, German-occupied Poland, who exploited thousands of um, forced and slave laborers, including female concentration captives at battery factories. Herbert Quant, like his father, escaped justice. According to Benjamin Ferenc, a Nuremberg trial prosecutor, if all the facts had come out at the time, Herbert Quant would have been prosecuted. But he wasn't. Instead, he'd stay one of Germany's wealthiest, leaving a fortune to children who still remain some of the richest people on the planet. Both Suzanne Clodden and her brother, Stefan Quant, have a near half ownership of BMW, with both serving on the supervisory board. And they still run a foundation in the name of their Nazi war criminal father, and even today seem to avoid full transparency. So in the summer of 2021, I had sent my questions to the uh, spokesman of Stefan Quant, and some of the questions uh, were never answered, including, do you think that the biography of Herbert Quant on the Herbert Quant Media website is transparent and accurate? And then a few months after I sent that question, overnight, uh, they uh, changed um, the biography to give a little bit more a semblance of transparency. So it's a very subtle, insidious way of whitewashing. In a press statement to us, 
the Quant family office press team mentioned several ways in which the family deals with their ancestors' Nazi past. One, Stefan and Gabriele Quant have openly spoken about it in an interview with a German newspaper in 2011. Two, since 2011, the family has supported the Documentation Center for Nazi Forced Labor in Berlin. Three, Stefan Quant and other family members have met some former forced laborers in person. And four, Suzanne Clauden supports different Jewish organizations and has received a prize for her engagement. We also asked why the Quants only commissioned research into their Nazi past after a German documentary about this past came out in 2007. The documentary put immense pressure on the family. In their answer, the press office seems to suggest that the family was shaken by the reporting, but did not have all the facts prior to them being made public on TV. However, the documentary also showed the family's unwillingness to help journalists investigate their past. Seit Beginn unserer Recherchen im Jahre 2002 werden alle Interviewanfragen abgelehnt. Schriftlich heißt es unter anderem, man wolle nur ungern in eine Situation gebracht werden, sich dafür verteidigen oder gar entschuldigen zu müssen, dieser Familie anzugehören. The family also did not answer some of our questions, questions like why they choose to keep awarding the much criticized Herbert Quant Media Prize for journalists, or if they're planning to change the name of the Herbert Quant Foundation. The biographies on both websites were sent to us by the press office. They mentioned some of his crimes, but commend him nonetheless. He supposedly was, quote, one of the most influential and visionary personalities in German corporate and economic history. He demonstrated daring and farsightedness. After the Second World War, the German population was initially unwilling to discuss and accept guilt. This slowly changed over the years through an emerging culture of remembrance, zu Deutsch Erinnerungskultur. This is seen as a national responsibility to accept, remember, and learn from the collective radicalization of the country and the horrendous crimes of the Nazi regime. This is formalized in the government financing memorials, museums, and archives. Through history lessons and political education, the nation strives to make National Socialism and the Holocaust graspable on the one hand, and on the other, it intends to form personalities who can resist mass or genocidal violence. It's meant to develop civil courage and a citizen's ability to take part in the democratic process. Rittingskultur is much debated in Germany. Has it become too symbolic, maybe too self-serving? But only the fringes ever question its existence. Je mehr wir darüber nachdenken und daran erinnert werden alle, so genauso wird man im Ausland daran erinnert. Und wir müssen endlich mal versuchen, das zu vergessen. To not partake in Erinnerungskultur is extremely questionable, especially if significant parts of one's wealth originate in war crimes and exploitation. It should not be hidden, but remembered.